this is the social media startup Room up strategies front. for the beginners. Come on down, no need to sit in the back. Plenty of seats right down front. Um, and so we're uh, being moderated by uh, DJ here. You can hear again from uh, Stanford and Stephanie. And then uh, Marcus, who we heard about this morning, but um, I guess we'll, we'll hear more from him now. Yes, so you will. Give him a big, big round of applause. All right, so um, this, uh, so my name is DJ Waldo, and I'll, I'm going to have all the panels introduce themselves quickly. But I'm I'm moderating this panel, and um, I will just say to start with, the challenge with this panel is that we've got a lot of strong personalities here. That's good for you guys because you're going to hear a lot of passion in what they're talking about, a lot of strong opinions. Uh, but we certainly want to hear from you too, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I want to start by just. Um, we're actually doing something a little bit different. We're going to have everybody introduce the person next to them so you get to hear from somebody else's perspective about who they are. And Marcus will circle back and introduce Stan. So I'll let those, these guys kick things off. Kick it, Stan. All right. So I'm introducing Stephanie. No, you can't. Don't look. I'll look. Okay. So Stephanie is a force of nature. She was recently um, recognized as one of the 70 legendary women in social media. Plus, she's rocking it out on Tweet Heart TV on YouTube. The account services director at 44 Doors and still finds ample time for the best job on earth, being a mom to her legendary <laughs> three-year-old boy. So welcome, Stephanie Wong. Thank you. Well, I'm here to introduce Marcus. So Marcus Sheridan has one heck of a story. In 2001, he stumbled upon his first business with two friends and began installing swimming pools out of the back of a beat-up pickup truck. Nine years later, and with the help of incredible innovations through inbound and content marketing, Sheridan's company became one of the largest pool installers in the U.S. and currently has the most visited swimming pool website in the world. Which, with such success, in late 2009, Sheridan started his sales marketing and personal development blog, The Sales Lion, and has since grown it to one of the strongest blog communities on the web. With so much success teaching others about content and inbound marketing, Sheridan has now moved on to becoming a very popular keynote and business speaker, known for his boundless energy and contagious enthusiasm when on stage. So welcome, Marcus. Thank you. All right, so my man here, the founder of Pushing Social, and he is pushing it with <laughs> 240 blog posts that he has personally written in the last two years. Really impressive. And here's the deal with Stanford. If you really want to start a blog for your business and have all those little questions that you constantly have coming to you, how to come up with new ideas, how to overcome writer's block, what to do about this, what to do about that, Pushing Social is a great site. He is an excellent blog coach, and he's also got three boys, which makes him pretty stinking awesome as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Stanford Smith. All right, as mentioned before, my name is DJ Waldo. I will be the moderator today. Um, I am the founder and CEO of a company named after myself, of course, uh, Waldo Social. And uh, basically what I do is uh, I've got a, a long history and background in email marketing. I'll be talking about email and social later today. Uh, later this afternoon, and so basically what Waldo Social does is help you optimize your email marketing campaigns. Um, so my job today, as I said, is to tame these three next to me, uh, and hopefully this is a challenge for me because I like to talk, is to talk less and let these guys talk more, and also to hear from you. Um, we are not doing our job today if you walk out of here with questions. So I want to be, be really clear about that. Um, the way we're going to kind of set things up is uh, we have a, a set of pre, kind of predetermined questions that we think you want to know, uh, and we're going to go through some of those. And then, if you have a burning question, though, while we're on that topic, don't hesitate to, to shout it out. If you want to feel like you're in school again and raise your hand, you can do that. Um, but feel free to shout it out, and we'll we'll do our best to address it. But what we're going to do mostly up here uh, at first, and then we'll really at the last you know. 20 minutes or so, we want to open it up to all of your questions to make sure we answer, every, answer everything. Um, we're going to be talking about three main areas, um, blogging, social media, and then just this overall bucket of content, which I think everything, you know, social media and blogging fall into. 
Um, and so I wanted to just kick things off by asking all of you, how many in the room would consider themselves, when it comes to social media, beginners? So that should have been every one of you, by the way, because you're in the social media for beginners <laughs> workshop. It's kind of a trick question, but okay, so most of you say that. And, and I'm glad actually Marcus raised his hand because it's an interesting, it's an interesting question because I think most people should, should raise their hands Dude, for I'll that. Dude, I'll tell you I mean, what, I, the more I get into this, the more I realize I don't really have a clue what I'm doing because it changes so fast. I mean, if, in, if any of us think we're like really way far ahead of anybody else, we, we're totally screwed up. Yeah, and, but, but that's a really good point. That's what we're going to talk about today. Some of these questions, you know, I, I want to be very clear about this. What we're going to share with you today are based on our experiences around social and content uh, and blogging, but it's not set in stone. You know, as Tom Webster said, you have to do the work. You have to do what works best for you. You've got to ask the right questions, ask better questions. So what, what these folks are going to be sharing with you today is what has worked for them. Um, and, and hopefully, again, we're going to be answering all of your questions. So um, I want to kick things off, Marcus, by I'm asking ready. you I'm to ready. talk about, we're going to talk about blogging first. And the first question is, what are the most common blogging mistakes that you think people make? What are the things that, that you, you cringe when oh, you you're see? On the spot okay, so too. I'm going to speak everything in terms of a business blog, right? Okay, that's how I see the world from a business standpoint. Having owned one, having multiple business blogs, and teaching other companies how to do it now. We make lots of mistakes. I think, and I don't want to, I'm just going to say one because I want everybody else to get their time. I think the first one that comes to mind is we have this, uh, like, conception, this, excuse me, this, this uh, misconception that blogging is for the intellectual elite. And that's not a reality. My people from Block, are you here? Raise your hand. Okay, my, my people from Block. Uh, for, all right, Jason, yeah. Jason, really quick, stand up. How many people in your company? I went out, by the way, I went out and spoke to his company, and he's in Michigan, and I'm just pulling him out because this is a perfect example of mistakes people make and how you can change it. So how many employees? <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. So how many employees do you have? We have 75 employees. How many, you have 75 employees. Now, before you really caught the vision of blogging and content, yes. How many actively were participating in your company's content? One. One, okay. Today, how many are actively participating in your company's content strategy, blog posts, videos, etc.? There are probably 40 people on our team of 75 who are writing content, and I would say virtually everyone is contributing to, hey, this should be a blog, I'll kick this over to this person. Cool. That's great. Yeah. That, Thanks to our, well, I went to our company last September. But you know, it's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with me. It's, we, think about it for a second. Your people for years have been explaining to prospects and clients answers to their questions. But yet for some reason, we think that our employees who are paying to answer these questions can't do the same when it comes to the web. And it doesn't make any sense. And so we've got to stop selling our people short. Block did it. I've seen multiple other companies do it. It doesn't matter if you are blue collar, white collar, allow your employees to write because they're better than you think. So, so I think just to kind of summarize, I think one of the mistakes as Marcus is saying is just having one person within your company or you know, blogging. Everybody should be thinking about blogging. I think it's a great example of having people it's a contribute, contribute ideas. It is say, a this should be a blog post or this should be something that our customers want to know more about. Yeah, Stan, a similar question for you, Stan. You know, what, what is a mistake that you see? I think one big mistake I see is that... Can you hear us back there, by the way? Can't let us know. The company wants to, or the individual who wants to start a blog, they wait until they see the perfect scenario, or they have the perfect content, or they know exactly how many times they should post a week. And what I learned is that if you want to start your... The best thing to do is just to start your blog. Because it's not until that point do you really understand what your voice is, what you're passionate about, and what you actually have to say. You know, so if you kind of like play with your blog in your mind and don't get out there and actually start it, you probably won't. So I think that's the very first thing, and you have to do it your own way to begin with, and then you can start taking on a lot of the tips and the recommendations that you see out there. But just get started. Very good, Steph. Anything you want to add to that as far as you know mistakes that you're seeing? You know, I think uh, you, you both have brought up really good points. Uh, you can't, um, I, I think that really playing off the whole, everything has to be perfect all the time. And I think 
that's really where I see a lot of people, you know, pausing and just waiting and saying, no, you know, this, this one isn't good enough. Or maybe they start it and then they read through it. Nope, still not good enough. And they never post it. Mm -hmm. Well, then a month has gone by and now your content is technically old because this event has already passed. It's, it's still relevant, but it's not relevant as much as it was if you would have just gone ahead and posted it. Right. So uh, I know that I, I do that a lot. I sit on content and I don't push it out. And I've learned from that very, very quickly. And I think that I see a lot of other people doing that as well. But you know, lots of times we see these older blogs out there and I hear people complain, this blog sucks. How's it so popular? And the only answer is they just started before everybody else did. I mean, time is a big, big deal here. Mm -hmm. And so like, if we wait to be perfect, we're never gonna start. I mean, we're all utterly flawed up here. In, in a certain aspect I'm not, to our, I'm not, yeah, I'm our business, right? Oh Marcus, right? Is, Marcus is clearly speaking for himself. <laughs> right, I right, know I am. Like, I mean, I just, just you know, like, like Godin says, ship it. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you can't be, it can't be a train wreck, but you gotta get it out there. Well, and, I, and I'll kind of add to that too. I think when you're first starting a blog, you know, similar to what everybody's saying is you gotta ship it, you gotta put it out there, is remember when you're first starting, I think, I think we have this conception or misconception actually that there's millions of people out there that are reading our content. Well, when you're starting, it's just not true. You know, when I started my personal blog a couple of years ago, my mom, my dad, and occasionally my wife would read it. You know, I mean, but that's it. But we have this feeling because it's out there. I mean, there, there's a crazy stat about the number of blogs that are started. Like every, a new blog is started, I don't want to spend something like every five minutes or something even maybe five seconds. So I think there's this, this, this fear that, you know, somebody's going to call you out on something you, you didn't do it right. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. I want to kind of build on that too um, and stand direct this one to you. Um, how do you find the time to do it? Mm. You know, because we've got, we're all busy people. We've got all this other, all the things to do. How do you find, pull out, carve out time in your day to actually blog? I think it, it comes down to priorities first. So, I mean, like, and when I hear that, you know, I just don't have time to blog, I say, what do you have time for during your day? And a lot of people I talk to, they say, well, you know, I spend about 50% of my day or 30% of my day on business development or actually going out there and getting business. And I'm like, well, if you blogged, you're going to be bringing in some pre-sold people. You're actually going to expand your platform. How much time do you spend on making sure that your website ranks well in Google? And you'll find that companies are spending a lot of time on that. And writing a blog is one of the best ways of getting your website ranked well in Google. So for me, it comes down to priorities. Pushing social and your blog is super important. So I can carve out an hour a day. And I think we're all, we're all surprised about how much time it takes. But if you just say, I got to get this done in an hour, not two hours or three hours, it's amazing what you'll do in that hour amount of time. So. Look at your priorities. If you have other platforms that are rocking for you, and then maybe blogging is not your priority, but everybody has time for it. I guess that's where I'm coming at. Everybody has time for it. Uh, how many people in here are blogging or have a blog and are, would you say, are actively blogging? Okay, so about, Tom Webster would say 33% or so in here. Yeah. Um, is it a representative sample? Yeah, exactly. That's my theory. <laughs> so so that's, that's interesting to me. So not everybody is blogging. So part of what we're hoping to convince you in this, in this section, at least, is that, you know, reasons why you should be. Um, so, Steph, on that too, I mean, how do you find time to build that into your day to blog? Because even you said, you know, there's times where you build this, you, you start to... Uh, write this post and then you say, well, I'm not going to push it out right now. I mean, how do, you, how do you make that decision? How do you decide, you know, build that time into your day? I think uh, the majority of my time, I'd say a good 90% of my content uh, that I put out on my personal site is, of, is through video. And so that, um, there's some quick writers out there. There's some writers that maybe takes a couple days in order for you to get a post out. So the same kind of goes for me that I can hurry up, I can film, I can edit, and I could get it out in one night. But it does depend on, on how much time you, you want to spend on doing that. Uh, but then, again, it's just really, what do you want out of it? And how important is it to you? And I think knowing that that feeling that you get once it's posted and then people either start to comment on it or say something about it, that's when you really get that feeling like, okay, this is really worth it and I'm glad that I spent that time. But again, you have to really figure out how important it is to you. And you have to figure out how important it is in order for me to maybe not do something else that evening or, you know, hey, I have a quick, I have a quick break in my day, what am I going to do with it? So again, it's, everyone has 
24 usable hours in the day. It just all depends on what you do with it. And, and so on that note too, uh, Marcus, how, how often should you be blogging? I, mean, I think you mentioned in the beginning, Stan has 200 and something blog posts in two, in two years. In two years. I mean, that's minutes, an incredible yeah. number. Um, I know people that blog every and he day. Has, wait, he has a know? full-time job, by the way. And so he does this as a secondary part of his right. life. And, and that just shows you- And he has you, three And he has children. three boys, and he's a pretty good dad, right? So you combine these Fairly. things and- Again, Marcus's opinions here are not yeah. necessarily shared by the, the rest of The husband part is where we're <laughs> having a problem. Right. So what's the question? <laughs> so the question let me, is how, I guess how, the the question question is how often- Let me say something about this. All right. There is hit as often as you possibly can within your business. Now, here's the thing. If you had talk, I'm just going to, I'm going to beat on Block here. Block Imaging is the name of the company. If you had gone to Block when we first started with them and said, how often can you all blog? It was one person talking. Mm -hmm. And so for her, it was a huge weight on her shoulders because she was carrying the weight of the entire marketing and social media department right here, which is the problem with most businesses because we don't get it as most businesses. But we don't see the vision that is, we have all these potential content producers, yet we're asking one person to be that guy. It doesn't make any sense to me when we're paying all these other folks in our company to produce this stuff through their words to our existing clients. Now, today they have 30 people doing it. What that means is if each person in their company writes one blog a month, they have a blog every single day, a new article. That's a beautiful thing. They're at a different level now. So for them, we were even talking before this, what their new goals were, what their new goals are, and their new goals are different than what their old goals were because they have a different culture, they have a different vision, and that vision now is everybody is a part of it. It's true synergy at its finest. And if they're doing less than one every day, it means they're really not utilizing their existing talent base. So to answer the question about time, if you haven't struggled with time, look around you. Utilize your talent because you probably got a whole lot of it that you haven't tapped into. I, I have seen this again and again and again. You know, I just, just really quickly, I mean, like I, 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 if you go online and you put in that exact question, how many times a week or how many times a month should I blog, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of posts about it. You'll have a, quite a few of them on Pushing Social. And I just realized that you gotta just shift your mindset about this. So remember back when you know you met your significant other or your boyfriend, girlfriend, and imagine that your blog post is a relationship. It's that conversation you're having with your audience. Now imagine what would have happened in my life if I would have told my wife, you know, I'm just gonna only call you when I have something to say. Or I'm only gonna just call you maybe once a month. We wouldn't have gone very far. <laughs> if I would have said, oh, I tell you what, I'm gonna step it up and we're gonna talk once a week. <laughs> it wouldn't have gone very far. So I'm thinking you need to talk, you need to think about your customers as I gotta start this relationship with them. What, what if you start out and say, I'm gonna call you every hour? We'll see, now that's a problem. That's a problem. But you will find girls that dig you calling them every yeah, hour. And the yeah. thing about, but that's a perfect example. There is the audience that would love to be, ultimately you're gonna to have to set this yourself and the people will fall in. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the reason I asked that question, I think it's an important one about, about how much. I mean, I see certain blogs that um, they will post multiple times every single day and they'll have Magical. different categories and they'll have this and, <laughs> and clearly it depends on how much how many resources you have right. there's others that post sort of to your point stan of when you have something to say my feeling is the average one to ten million dollar company should post at least two times a week as a general rule of thumb and that's a very general average rule of thumb two times a week minimum but two to three is a good number for most small businesses i think there's a question about yeah, that yeah. so i'm trying to do that just right now. I had come with a journalism background now going into the marketing world and trying to train. It's a beautiful people. combination. You 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 really have so much to look forward to because your existing talent. Mm -hmm. You could do a lot in this industry. Um, but I'm trying to train guys who have twenty years of marketing experience. So they, they have the expertise, they have the content that I need, but they're not good writers. How do you train them to do that? How do you get them into that mode? Great question. Great question. I mean, why take a well, I, mean I think that's yeah. the whole question, right? Right, like you talk, right? I mean, I think the problem is we think that writing is different than we talk. So y'all are going to see me speak later. I'm going to just do my goofy thing. 
just like I am right here. I use my own funky vernacular and I write exactly like that on both of my blogs because it is my voice. I, and, and the moment that we really embrace that voice, now granted, you gotta have a filter. You know, if you're the type that cusses a lot, you can't be you know, cussing all the time on a business blog. If you do, that's just dumb. But other than that, you have got, we've, we've got to stop thinking that this is an English paper because it really, really isn't. We have to be conversational in our tone. And sometimes you have to tell a person, okay, I'm going to record you. I'm going to ask you a question. You answer it to me. That is the blog post, and that's the way they need to learn to write, just like that. I've done that before with people that said, I can't write. I said, okay, what's the title? Let's say the title is, um, you know, how to find, what are the five best social media tools? Okay, so that's the title of the post. What do you think of the five best social media tools? Have the person explain it. And then when they hear themselves, you know, you ask them, can you write that? And they can. But we try to change the two, and they shouldn't be changed. Be very careful, though, about who are good writers and who are not good writers. I mean, like, if you come from a journalism background, you know what good writing is. However, the typical person reading a blog, they don't need an amazing piece of journalism. They just need the facts, and they just need it presented to them. As a matter of fact, the more polished they sound, you, I think your effectiveness is going to start to go down. So, I mean, like Marcus is right. I think that if you could just set up a process in which they can start writing. I love it. You know, it's just a catch-22. A business will go, we don't have good writers. So, but the only way That's they're going to That's a fallacy. Be, right. Yeah. Complete the, fallacy. Yep. But they don't get good writers because they don't let anybody write. Right. You know, so you have to let them start writing, and then you get. I, I I went and spoke in Chicago to a basement waterproofing company a month ago. These are like old dogs, all dudes, fifty years old, didn't go to college. They got like goatees. Yeah. Yeah, right. My man, hey, 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 just roll with it, brother. And so the thing about it is, you got all these dudes that are sitting there, and they catch the vision that is how content works as a sales tool and, and as a marketing vessel. And they all jumped in the fray. I'm telling you, this guy now, <laughs> these dudes with their tattered jeans and earrings are belogging. And they are killing it because they bought in. It's no different. And so again, it's not a blue or white collar thing. They do have the ability to communicate. We're, we're not talking about writing, right? We're actually talking about communicating right. and teaching. That's really what we're talking about here. And I, I'll add to that um, a couple of thoughts really quick is that I think when you're looking for people to write, and I'm, I'm curious how this worked out at this, this block with now 40 people that are actively blogging, but I used to look for two things. You're either a, good, a really good writer or you have a, really, a lot of really good content to share. Because I look at it two ways. If you're a really good writer, I can give you content and you'll figure out a way to make it sound really good. If you're uh, have a lot of good knowledge and content about the product or service, I can help, I can find good writers to help craft That's that right. message That's into right. something interesting. You know, so, so it plays both ways. And you know, when I, I was at a company called Bronto, an email, email marketing provider in North Carolina, and um, at the time, similar to Block, we had one person that was blogging. And so what we looked for was people who were passionate, people who were passionate about writing. And some of them, as you said, we found in the engineering department. And it turns out they really were good writers and they knew their stuff. They just, we didn't think of them as bloggers. But think about right engineers. Like he was telling me about an engineer at lunch. These, one of his greatest content producers bloggers is an engineer. A total stiff if you knew him in real life. Well, that's how you would label him. Because he doesn't seem like some gregarious, like passionate guy. But he has bought in and is so excited to participate as the engineer in the company's marketing. Yeah. He's completely empowered now. But you know, to mix that up, if you don't have, just look at everybody's skill sets. And I mean, like I was just intrigued by what Stephanie said, because she just made video sound like just as easy as <laughs> writing. But, but you may realize, I mean, Gary Vaynerchuk started off this way. He couldn't write, but he could get on a camera for 10 minutes and give, you know, a really cool you know, um, review of a wine. So, I mean, like, just look at your skill set. You may be better from a podcasting standpoint. You may be good from a, um, a video standpoint. So just look at your total skill set. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you yeah. do both, video and writing, mm -hmm. or just do one? Yeah, I mean, it's honestly whatever works for you, but if you can do both, do both. It's, it's content. Like, to me, the consumer would probably rather see a video than read, would they? Not true. It's, you're, you're right partly. 60% of all 
all people are visual learners, and we're getting more so because we're growing up with, with this in our hand, and we're becoming all visual. But, but oftentimes, let's say you first start researching a product. You might start textually because you're just beginning, you're at the top of the sales funnel. Once you start to get pretty serious, let's say about a swimming pool, you're not going to want to watch a 20-minute video about fiberglass swimming pools as your first bit of content. You might want to read an article, how much does a fiberglass pool cost? But then once you start to get down the funnel, closer to your decision, you're willing to invest more time in a 20-minute video. And before that, it might be a three-minute video. This is all based on where the person is in the buying cycle, and oftentimes that'll dictate which content. I think it all depends on just content in general. Um, you know, just like you were saying, in the, in the buying cycle, um, there's a lot of different types of videos that can be done, and so honestly, you really need to, to just take a step back and figure out what makes sense for that video. Um, as I spoke earlier, um, the majority of some of the, the videos, sure, they might be one to two minutes long, but to Marcus's point, there are videos that do make sense to be longer. They just give them some, you know, just more meat to them, get some more information out there for people. Maybe you're doing a demonstration. Uh, that's where, you know, you really have to just take a look at the content and figure out what you need to do. Uh, retail store, I'm just going to demonstrate items. That's what it's going to do, you know, like, it's Awesome it's idea, run with it. But, <laughs> but so you do both, you have a, a short one, a little long one, both, and for more in depth explanation, it needs to be, and both. Well, well, keep in mind, too, though, you can also combine video and text. I mean, there's no reason that you can't transcribe that video uh, into text. And so then you have both. In fact, Jay, Jay Bear, I think, is moderating in, in maybe the main room somewhere, and he does this social prose podcast. He pays somebody then to transcribe that podcast into text. And so, you know, some people, some people really do like, you know, to Marcus's point, some people like to read that. Some people like to... Uh, listen to it. Um, I think if you're doing a product review where you're having to show something, video certainly makes sense, but you can also give the, high, the you know, highlights of it in the, in the text below. But you're thinking good there because you're thinking about two different types of users. We oftentimes get stuck and think our, our prospects are just one type of person. Some people are just going to want text forever until the end of time. Some people are going to want short video. Some people are going to want long video, and some people want all three. If you can do a blog post that has a combination of that, you're always going to be better off because you know you're hitting all parties. Yeah, and there's a question in the, oh, sorry, there's a question here and then in the, in the back. Help, uh, blogging motivation, is there any studies, true studies available about the advantage of blogging regarding SEO? You know, you said true studies, and I was wondering, man. There's a lot of yeah, false ones. Yeah. <laughs> no, See, but Tom uh, Webster, by the way, has corrupted all of us because we I can't know, talk we're all... about stats or studies without you questioning our methodology. <laughs> now, but. Yeah, I'm scared to death to give my presentation now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Trust me, I'm there. You know, I can't cite one specific. But you don't know how much it's valid. That's all what I'm asking. No, there, okay. There's definitive studies. Content works as an SEO tool. I'm going to talk about it today. I'll show you in my, in, in my thing. Uh, I mean, content has more value than just SEO. Because really, it, it is the greatest sales tool in the world, in my opinion, if we use it the right way, which most of us don't as businesses. But uh, the answer is yes. There's no question. It has a ton of SEO value, and they can be directly tied and measured. And, and Tom would agree with that. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like our uh, leadership at the company may have even heard, I don't know if you guys speak or somebody, but I, I feel like we've gotten what you said so far. We began a blog, I uh, didn't really know maybe how or why we began a blog. It was uh, uh, executives uh, blogging at first, and now we opened it up to everybody, so everybody had the opportunity to blog, uh, encourage content and everything. But we've been doing it for probably two years, and we just get no fit. I mean, just nobody comes. I, I look at the analytics, I've, I've uh, begun kind of taking it upon myself to do social media and, uh, and, and uh, blogging. <coughs> Mm -hmm. to be or they want to accomplish with it. And, uh, and, and, and 
related to that, how important are we don't all, we don't have comments on there? How important are like comments readers being able to go in there and comment? Oh man, I, we could spend an hour talking about that one right there. Let's let's start with the first point because I think it's really interesting. I mean, I mean, I, I'd say you're you're kind of in that intermediate stage, so you might be in the wrong room. Um, but no, I'm just teasing you. So, so I mean, it's an interesting question though because you you've kind of gotten over that hump. You've discovered that blogging is important and you should be doing it and you're you're actively doing it. But people aren't. You know, you've built it, but people aren't coming to see it. Right. So, what, what you know, just what you just really about? quickly. Yeah. I mean, like, what is the blog about? I mean, like, what is your company uh, trying we, to we talk do, about? Uh, nonprofit marketing, uh, 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 consulting, communications, social media, uh, communications company. Sure, sure. And did you post last week? Yeah, we do uh, roughly three to four a week. Okay, what was the title of your last post? The very last post. Um, if you can remember, I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. Uh, offhand, I don't remember. Right, uh, right. I think we've been, I think we've been doing uh, stuff on uh, breaking down silos. Our CEO is really big on that. I think he, I think he posted about introverted marketing. Right, right. You know, and I mean, like, and this is going to be grossly simplified, but I think a lot of people are in the exact same position. It's like, I built it and they're not coming. And somebody told me three years ago they would. And the, the big thing, the reason why I asked you about, you know, what you're actually blogging about is that it really comes down to, first of all, the people in your, people in your niche. Okay, what are they asking questions about right now? Mm -hmm. Okay, and are you and do you know that? Like, do you know the top 10 questions? that people are asking about what you can do. And then have you written a series of posts on all of those questions? The reason why I, I kind of get down to that level is because Google is going to realize that hmm, you're relevant in this area. Two is that customers and influencers and things like that, that are in that particular area are going to see that you have a lot of great content talking about very specific questions. One of the things I feel that we can do a lot better at is that instead of, and I call it a writer's culture to blogging versus a business culture to blogging. We put up a blog and we sit down and go, what, I, what do I want to write about? You know, and it has to be more about what is my customers want to hear about and how can I provide them great information within that context. I'm not saying that you're not doing that, but I would definitely go back and say, wow, did my last 10 posts hit on very specific things that people are looking for out there? And you, and, You'll find that people, your audience will grow from there. We'll start growing. Can we answer the comment one? Yeah, let's. Yeah, because we actually had. Which, one by the way, I thought that was a spot-on answer. I mean, that was that's. They yeah. have a right now. They have a subject title problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can just listening to to what you said. I can already see that you have a subject title problem. And and if you address those questions that you get every single day, and the question was the title of the post, I guarantee that we would have a difference in terms of search results. And I'm concerned too that you might not be using a tool that's, if, and it, which I would think you are there, but if we should have clear tracking of this blog article has led to this many leads, and if we can't quantify that, then we have a problem. And, and I'll ask right. one more question. As a, so, so my background again is in email. Do you have any kind of email newsletter that you're sending out regularly? You can sign up for email alert when we have a blog post. Uh, okay. But, uh, we don't have a, uh, a newsletter per se that would uh, put them all together. So, so one way to share that content mm -hmm. is to create, and you could, and you could very simply create a newsletter that all it's doing is sharing fresh blog posts. I, I don't advise that as a long-term strategy for email marketing, but you could do that as a way to alert your people who have subscribed to the email list to then, you know, kind of push them back to that to cross promote a little bit too. But let, yeah, let's go, let's go to the com I want to go to the comments question a little bit because okay. I, I, I feel like that's, you, you hit a chord with Marcus for sure. Um, but Steph, maybe take that, you know, I, I want to ask this in two ways. One, should you have the ability for people, allow the ability for people to comment on blog posts? Um, and then as a, as a follow up to that too, do they really mean anything? Like, should, what kind of value is there in comments? I think there's a huge value in comments. Uh, that, that can be a community in and of itself is completely on your blog. Uh, it all depends. There's, there's people who love to comment on blogs, and then there's people who you might tweet it out or you might put it on Facebook, and they comment there. That's just the way they do things. And then there's other people who maybe want to get into a little bit more of a lengthy discussion, and I've noticed that that's typically when they want to put a comment in. So that's, you know, and I noticed that there's, there's a lot of great blogs out there that have communities, and I, I look at, you know, Mark Schaefer 
is a great example um, too, you know, obviously besides you guys, is that that is a community in and of itself on the blog. And so those are those people that like to comment there. And then of course you can have the comments that are happening on other media channels as well. So you just have to figure out where people are and then also, you know, make sure you respond on every channel that you can. I think it's I think we have to stress here that community does not equate to profits. And there is a skewed vision that blog comments, shares, likes, tweets equate to money. And the last I looked, when my mortgage bill came in, I could not send them some likes and tweets in the mail. In other words, if we are not turning a profit as a business, which ultimately has to be our number one goal always, it doesn't matter all those other numbers that we see. On the sales line, which is my marketing blog, I've got over, um, in this two and a half years, I have something like 16,000 comments, okay? And I once did a study on those 16,000 comments, and none of the people of those 16,000 that had commented were customers of mine. Now, some of them commented on my blog after they became customers. Okay. I have articles on my swimming pool site that have been read 100, 200, and 300,000 times. They have one like, two tweets. Some social media types might look at that and say that wasn't a very successful article, yet those articles have led, because of tracking, I'll talk about this later, to over a million dollars in sales on one article. I have over a million dollars in sales that I can track back to one article that doesn't have likes and tweets because it's not a very shareable subject. In other words, if you're buying a pool, Don, you don't brag to your friends on Twitter, I just spent 50,000 bucks on a pool. You just don't do it. I don't know why, but you don't. <laughs> right? Well, I will. I right? But Don, but Don comments on my blog, don't you? On the sales line. Yep. But are you a customer of mine? Yep. No, but you get into social media, don't you? So we have great conversation. And yes, indirectly, because he spreads the good word, that can lead to sales. Generally speaking, your newsletter is where your customers will talk to you the most. Because that is a private conversation of email. On a blog, generally, speak I'm talking generally I'm not saying this is a set defined rule on a blog you have less customers talking to you in the comment section if they're really getting down the funnel usually they'll do a direct contact this is across the board I've done this study on multiple businesses I'm not saying it's always the case but generally speaking that's what you can expect you know what and I think and I hate to say it Marcus but that's a great point you know, Sorry, bro. it's a brilliant point I mean like from a comment standpoint, is I really see comments as a trailing indicator of the people who already love you, you know, mm -hmm. for a lot of, so I, I, I went through and I looked at, you know, I offer a product off of Pushing, so, Pushing Social, and I realized that all my comments are coming from people I've met in other areas. And they went, oh, I, I saw you at that conference and I checked out your blog and I really liked the, the conversation we had and they left a comment. but. Basically, this is telling me the people I've already talked to, you know, so I mean, like, don't beat yourself up over comments. I hate when people do that. It's just, it's just not a business model, guys. It's comments not are not a business model. Right. Don't, don't think they are. Please. So as a moderator, my job is to move this conversation along a little bit. I know we've talked a lot about blogging. Um, <laughs> and part of that is because there's three passionate people up here that um, think okay. and, and actively blog. But I want to make sure that we're talking about other forms of social, too, specifically um, some, you know, Facebook and Twitter, and you're hearing a lot of that, obviously, throughout the day today, and you'll continue to hear more. So I want to move a little bit into that, and then I, and I still, we have, you know, about 15 minutes left to um, keep asking those questions. If you have that burning question, you know, ma make sure that we're getting it addressed. Um, also, everybody here is, as you can tell, personality-wise, pretty accessible, so you can ask us after as well. Um, but I wanted to move into social a little bit, um, specifically, and um, the, the question that comes up a lot is, how do you convince management to embrace social media and content marketing when they're just, they just don't understand it yet? They don't want to get involved and they're saying, why should we spend money on paying somebody to manage social media? So Stephanie, you can start off with that. How do you, how do you convince management to, to participate? Well, I think it's, it's just really digging down, um, take it upon yourself and to start working on some of those social media uh, opportunities for you and then go and look at your analytics 
and then go and present that as your case because that's exactly what they're looking for. They don't, you know, they don't really care that you had, um, you know, five people that just followed you. Those are not the analytics that you're trying to show. Show the analytics of where those people went after you had that conversation with them. And so you have to dig a little bit deeper because those are the analytics that the C-suite is going to want to know. Uh, again, the, the likes, the followers, that stuff does not matter to them. Um, it's the analytics that drive uh, sales or drive even just conversations inbound to your sales reps or even just to anyone in your corporation because that's what's going to move business forward. How would you do it, Stan? How would you convince, convince the C-suite? Right. The C-suite loves, I mean, like from a social media standpoint, I think it's incredibly important to present cost of sales. Okay? And I think it's kind of a, one of those things where every day a business spends X number of dollars to get a new customer in the door. Okay, and they spend that in display ads, they spend it on TV ads, or whatever have you. And there's a number, and I'm sure that C suite knows it. We're spending $150 for every new customer we bring in the door. And just like Stephanie said, you want to show how social media is trimming down that cost of that sale. Okay, so if a person comes to you via Twitter and, and Google Analytics, you can start to um, within all of your analytics, you can start to look at how many social actions co contributed to a conversion. Now, if you're able to show your C-suite that, listen, instead for this particular customer, we're getting them in from social media by a, for $100 versus $150, mm -hmm. then that's something they tangibly can start to wrap their heads around. I agree with you, Stephanie. If you go in and tell a CEO that we've got more Facebook likes, you're going to get thrown out. Well, I think you, know? you, you brought up another good point of what you're saying is uh, how much it costs for you to bring in a brand new customer. Right. The other fact you need to look at is the cost of keeping those customers. Exactly. And whenever you build that community through social media, whether it be you know, blog, Facebook, Twitter, whatever the case may be, you're helping those customers. So whether you're answering questions, there's a lot of different things that can happen through social media. So not only you have the cost of finding a new customer, there's also the, you always have to pay attention to your current customers. Right. I, I just want to pause for a second. Are we answering your questions? Because I, 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 I know just if I get sort of general nods, are we getting the questions that you, burning questions that you have? Or, or are some of you in here saying, I don't really know what to ask, so just tell me what I should know. <laughs> Find that often. Okay. Um, I saw a couple. There's, nods, so. there's one. Yeah, in the, in the red there. Sorry. I just want to make sure we're getting different people too. Yeah. Good question. It's a very good question. I think I think Pareto's law always takes over, right? 80-20. 80% 20. Um, 80 of our business that we derive from social media is going to come from 20% of our platforms over time. And Pareto is pretty smart like that. And so I found early on that for us, our main platform was going to be content in the form of text or video. And so for our pool company, you know, we made literally millions in sales off of not using Facebook, not using Twitter, not using certainly Pinterest. And that does not mean we could, we could have used them, but it wouldn't have had the same return on investment because we saw clearly what we could be the best at. I think sometimes we tried to be a jack of all social media trades. We end up being a master of none. And it's a huge problem that we have you really do have to get great at at least one platform first, and then it's time to break out from that. So for us, that's what we did. It was first with text, then with video, and then came some of these other things. But you have to be great with at least one first, in my opinion. I think you need to ask the right question before you go into a new platform. So it is not a good question to just go, I wonder what it's about and start to invest time. I think you should ask yourself, what it is about my brand or about my value proposition that I can't tell in the social platforms I am right now? So if I'm a florist, I probably can't tell how gorgeous my flowers are in a written text, blog post. But Pinterest, in that regard, I can get a 
photo out there and I can put quotes underneath it and that is going to help me express my brand story in a more concrete way. It drives me nuts with the shiny thing, you know, and everybody's chasing it, you know? And I just ask, if you can get your brand value proposition expressed really well in just one platform, then max it out. Mm -hmm. And you're good to go. Stop the social guilt. You don't have to be on every platform. Good phrase. Great phrase. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Great phrase. I just want to. How many people in here are familiar with uh, King Arthur Flower? Okay, some kind of northeastern people in the room then. So King Arthur Flower is a company based in, uh, I think, Vermont, and they sell like they, they they write about recipes, but they also sell anything cooking related. And um, I've interviewed a couple people there before, and one of the things that's really interesting, I noticed they have a following on Twitter, but it's, they don't really, they're not really that active there. They do a lot with, I know we've talked a lot about blogging, but that's because that's their home base for them. That's where they put the majority of their content. But because they have a lot of, and they've been doing more stuff with Pinterest, because as, as Stan said, there's pictures there. There's things that they want to share their story through pictures, but they find their biggest bang for the buck for them is Facebook. When they post something on Facebook, they have dozens, hundreds sometimes, thousands of comments mm -hmm. because people are, that if they're able to post a picture and ask a question and have their community rally around that, they have found that they can't do that on Twitter. So they chose to have less of a presence on Twitter. It's not working for them. And so that's just one example of a company that's chosen you know, to, to really focus, I guess, in two areas, in this case, blogging and Facebook, but it, that's, that's working for them. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is sort of a Facebook slash blogging question. If that's, I know you were trying to get away from blogging. But hey, we want, we're honestly, we're going to talk about whatever you guys want, so that's, that's fine, yeah. Uh, I've had a personal blog up since the beginning of the year. Subscribers, but I'm having trouble. You know, I post, every time I post, you know, I, I post it on Facebook as well. But I'm having trouble. I feel like grabbing that Facebook audience and leading them into the blog. I just don't feel they're following me there with that same enthusiasm and presence. And I just wonder if there's something, any kind of correlation, or if there's something you know I could focus on that would grab a lot of that. What I think is a built-in readership. You know, my first, my first thought is why move them? Mm -hmm. yeah. like, why do you feel the need to move them into the blogging platform they already are loving what you have on that platform? Well, because I, I don't overlap content. I mean, the, you know, Facebook, I keep the, sh the short little bursts and small thoughts and things that I feel like I, or like it's a longer form that I can mm -hmm. write, you know, three, four, five hundred words on, I'll, I'll blog about. So I... Have you done summary posts on Facebook? In other words, you start with your, you're a funny dude, I can see, listen to you, you got a good shtick going on. So like you start with your first couple paragraphs of your blog post on Facebook and you say, read more here and you and, and get them started, you know, and then get them in the funnel and then allow that to push them down and they'll pop through the other end. It's almost like tell the first half of the joke and then they've got to go to, yeah. but actually in all seriousness, we do that, you know, we talk about that in email marketing too. I mean, you could do two things in email. You can write the entire article mm -hmm. and hope people read it or you can write, I mean, you guys have all seen this. You write the first headline in a couple of sentences and then there's a read more, Think about more. those stupid GoDaddy yeah. commercials, right? You know, like at the end, they're like, find out what she does here. <laughs> right? And so you, all of a sudden they get flooded with like a billion um, views, all because it's a really strong uh, to be continued. Yeah, I, I think it's a good, I'm going to write that down. It's, uh, I think because uh, when, you, when you post the, uh, when you put the post on Facebook, it, it'll maybe show like the first two or three sentences, which I guess, you know, it's really not enough to get anybody um, hooked into it, I guess. But yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe you need to add more humor up front. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I was Adam. Yeah. So. Any any more questions? Yeah. Um, so whether I actually kind of take on Twitter, I, I think it, um, our Twitter account is. I, I think a good way. I, I think I'm, I'm good with the medium. I, I think we interact with people. Talking about trying to be very good at one medium and not trying to do everything. Um, we have Facebook page. We have a LinkedIn page. We uh, have all that. 
My, my question there is, uh, we're a communications company, so we do consulting with nonprofits and we do your communications needs come to us if you have any advice on that. If we have a Facebook page or LinkedIn page or whatever and a potential client or a client goes to it and goes, they really know what they're doing. I mean, our page doesn't look like we have done much with it. Is, is it, do we have more of an obligation, I guess, to try to reach out and do these other media well? As a, almost as a, a, a presentation thing to be able to show we can do it, or do you, would you still say no? Just get focus on one, get through it, and you have no obligation to anybody. You really don't. Ulti ultimately, your obligation is to turn a profit. And which one of those is going to help you turn the profit the most? Probably a clear, clean focus on one platform first, and then breaking out. I see. What you, I think what you're saying is is that you're selling marketing services. Right. So your clients are coming to you or your prospects are wondering, how do I validate that these guys know what they're doing? Right. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. And I mean, like, can I... If, they, if they go to our Facebook page and they see... You, you know, sell Facebook they, services, though? Twitter. Oh, okay, they've got Twitter going. They go to our Facebook page and they're going, I want to get a buy sponsor company on. But you see, most people don't shop like that. And they, they because do. most people, they use their platform. Right. People research through blogging. That's mainly what they do. Some people just mainly shop through and research through Facebook. Others mainly through Twitter. I want to take, um, I know we've got a couple more questions. There's one here and then one in, in the back here. And then I think we've got to wrap up because we've got 10 minutes till Mitch gets on stage. So take just a couple more questions. Yeah. You may not want to address this without billing me a consulting fee, but um, I'm in an industry, financial advisory, that has a lot of barriers. And uh, so my approach has been I've got to have a presence, social media that's allowed. And I've got to be able to be found through search without spending a fortune. I, I have, uh, I am heading up a, a social media pilot for my franchise group, but that went from being helpful to where the home office is wanting to bill me for their monitoring software to remain compliant. So that's a long preamble, but what can I do personally as a professional? Staying clear of all the rules. But a lot of people don't realize that I can't tweet a lot of things because it's con it, it is considered a recommendation. Mm -hmm. It's against FINRA rules. And I just did my annual compliance audit this week, and I only got in jail twice in the past year, which is a miracle. Wow. So uh, I, I just need resources. Well, it's definitely tough because uh, I know that um, I've actually had a conversation with some people at Charles Schwab about um, looking into what they're doing with social media and even what they're doing with mobile marketing and um, the regulations that you're mentioning that are in place. Um, it definitely would, I, th I think, actually go for a better conversation, you know, longer one a little bit later, just because. Uh, I don't think that anyone in this room, unless they're in the exact same industry as you are, understands all those regulations, because I think I was listening to those, and I think I was shocked. And I spent 14 years at that firm. I probably know more about social media than that whole firm's executive <laughs> office. And that's not a, a negative comment. It's just uh -huh. the way it is. Yeah. Everybody's afraid of going to jail. I mean, the compliance jail. Right. Okay. I am. I am too. If it makes it feeling better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that. And I'm not even in an industry. Yeah. That's a really I wouldn't do one. well in jail. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one thing I just one bit of advice, and I'm not an expert in any way, and I have full disclosure. <laughs> but I think that you may have to be a fast follower. You know, and I know that. The financial industry, the medical industry, mm -hmm. people are and their packs are pushing to try to get the SEC to clarify their rules on these things, the FEC, I mean, and, and FDA for that matter. So you just may need to be a fast follower in this regard, and you may have to use your platform as a broadcast platform versus an engagement platform and toe the line until you have that capability. Um, I want to get to that last question. I'm going to find a website for you. It's like. Financial social today or something. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I'll tell you in a minute once I find it. Right. Let's take that last question. I think we got to kind of wrap this up. This is the beginner workshop. Can you give us just the down and dirty real quick on Google Analytics and how, how to start with that? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> in, you, want in, you want that in about, I think the first start is to go to uh, google.com slash analytics would be stage one, and then can anybody else speak more? In, you know, in I've been short... thinking about that blog post because whoever <laughs> designed Google Analytics was a complete techno nerd and was not thinking about people like you and I. Because they really, it's not intuitive. I don't care what anybody tells me, it's not intuitive at all. And so the answer is, you're going to have to throw yourself in, you're going to have to watch the videos, and it's not going to be easy. Sorry, it's just not, because it's not intuitive, it's designed poorly, and they need people like you working in their office to point them as to how it works when you look at charts and stuff versus the way they're doing it right now because it's way off. And the newest version is worse than the old version. So, be encouraged. Uh, <laughs> one, one resource for you is this Google Occam's Razor is written by Avinash Kashyyyk. Huh? It's Occam's Razor. Just put in Occam's O-C-C-A-M-S Razor and then put in Google Analytics. And you should get a guy, his name is Avinash Kashyyyk, and he actually has some amazing tutorials and blog posts about how to get started with Google Analytics to get something out of it. So I think we're officially getting the hook now. Um, but, but thank you all for, for joining us. If you have, we didn't answer your question, come see any of us. We'll